Michael Haidt, family killer, narcissist. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. The issue of narcissists and killing is one that is important to understand. Most narcissists don't kill. When a narcissist is wounded or experiences challenge, fuel there is a threat to control which will cause an ignition of fury. Some narcissists are better than others at keeping that fury under control. Some narcissists react with cold fury, meaning that they will cold shoulder you, ignore you, glare at you, freeze you out, sit there in a huff. Other narcissists will respond with heated fury, shouting at you, screaming at you, insulting you, spitting at you, using physical violence, sexual violence. It might range from shoving you or preventing you from leaving through to slapping you, punching you, kicking you, headbutting you, or using a weapon against you. The expression of heated fury is particularly vicious. Sometimes it may just be a one-off act of physical violence, perhaps a shove or a push, a slap or a punch. In other instances, it could be a flurry of blows. And in some instances, the narcissist loses control to the extent that they end up killing the victim. That is often the case where a domestic violence situation has arisen that basically, and it's usually a man, has lost it. And often that's as a consequence of ignited fury. Not always. In some instances, it may be a non-narcissist who has been pushed and as a consequence of perhaps acting under the influence of drink or drugs and other factors which have diminished their emotional empathy, they've lashed out at their partner, exhibiting anger rather than fury, and they've struck, attacked that person, and wanting to hurt them, but not intending to kill them, have then ended up killing them. So there are instances whereby, as a consequence of what is categorized as domestic violence, non-narcissists inadvertently kill their partner, and where narcissists inadvertently kill their partner, the latter being as a consequence of a lack of control of their ignited fury. It's also the case that in some instances, and this is even rarer, that a narcissist will take steps to kill and engage in premeditated murder. Most instances of where a narcissist kills and it is unusual that it happens, are as a consequence of a loss of control through ignited fury. But there will be some instances where a narcissist has taken steps to plan the death of their partner, and it's a premeditated murder. It's important to recognise that many instances of a domestic assault that results in death is likely to involve a narcissist using ignited fury. And we're able to ascertain whether that individual is that person as a consequence of an analysis, of course, of a range of behaviours over a sustained period of time. There might be an instance, for example, that somebody, and even an empathic individual, can be driven to kill, that as a consequence of an external stressor, they lash out. So, for instance, it might be a cuckolded husband who finds out that his wife's been having an affair. He isn't a narcissist, but this knowledge causes him such shame and embarrassment and anger that he erupts with anger and hit, stabs her with a handily placed kitchen knife. He lost it in the heat of the moment. He's not a narcissist, but death has resulted. Or it might be the instance, for example, where a victim of a narcissist, somebody who's being repeatedly abused, loses their temper or acts in self-defense as a consequence of the rep repeated violence they're being subjected to. That repeated abuse re reduces their emotional empathy for their partner and they pick up a hammer and swing and she bops him over the head, thus killing him. She isn't a narcissist, he may well be, and therefore she has acted in self-defense, but there's been a reduction in her emotional empathy causing her to lash out. So instances of where people have been killed in domestic violence scenarios can include 
non-narcissist killing another person as a consequence of an external stressor, reducing their emotional empathy, and more commonly, where a narcissist has experienced ignited fury and has gone too far with that ignited fury. Again, it's important to point out that the incidences of narcissist killing is still rare in itself. Most narcissists do not. However, there are instances whereby behaviours are such that the narcissist ignited fury has severe consequences. And here we have reportage by Inita Bole in the Daily Mail about Michael Haight, which provides you with interesting information in tragic circumstances. Can neighbours hear a gunshot? The chilling Google search history of Utah dad who killed his wife, mother-in-law and their five children before turning gun on himself revealed. As cops say daughter told friend at church function he was acting strangely. Let's analyse the information that's provided here to see whether this is a family killer narcissist. Chilling Google searches from the phone which belonged to a Utah dad who killed his wife, five children and his mother-in-law suggests the twisted killings could have been premeditated. According to a newly unsealed search warrant affidavit obtained by East Idaho News, Michael Haight, 42, was found to search how loud the sound of gunshots for multiple weapons might be, as well as whether they could be heard from a house or by neighbours, presumably when deployed. One has to say that's a fairly dim-witted thing to do in terms of, one, undertaking a search and creating evidence, but also gunshots are pretty loud, and therefore they're going to be heard from a house. Height is accused of the brutal murders of his wife, Tausha, 40, his five children with ages ranging from 4 to 17, and his mother-in-law, Gail Earl, 78, before allegedly taking his own life. Investigators have combed through the Enoch family home where the bodies were found following a welfare check on January the 4th. A warrant was served to collect all electronic devices in which an iPhone was found on his eldest daughter, Macy Lynn's bedside table, as well as a second iPhone and a luggage pile a couple of feet from her bed. Five phones, tablets and iPads were also found in the master bathroom attached to the master bedroom where the bodies of two adults and a child had been discovered, the outlet reported. An iPhone was also discovered next to Height's body and sent to the Utah Tech Digital Forensics Lab for analysis. Searches found on the phone include How loud is a 9mm? How loud is a 40mm? Can you hear a gunshot in a house? Can neighbours hear gunshots? Additional searches related to those were also discovered, but it remains unclear at this time what they were. All took place on December the 30th, 2022, between 10am and 12pm, five days prior to the alleged murder-suicide. The night before the bodies were discovered, Tausher and one of her daughters were allegedly seen at a church function. Police told KSLTV that neighbours told officers that one of Haight's daughters had sent a text message to a friend the night before she was found deceased, stating her dad came home, was acting strange, and she was worried. It's been alleged that Haight had been investigated for child abuse two years earlier, but police decided not to charge him. Enoch Mayor Jeffrey Chestnut said police were still investigating the killings while revealing Tausha had filed for divorce from her husband of 20 years on December 21st, exactly two weeks before the murders. Filing of divorce may well have been an act which causes massive wounding. If he were a narcissist, the filing of a divorce petition, meaning that she no longer wants to be with him, would result in, of course, massive wounding to the narcissist because this would be the loss of the intimate partner primary source. Records released in late January show that hate had displayed a violent pattern of behaviour, physical violence, rudimentary manipulation, which might be an assertion of control, towards his family for years, sustained pattern of behaviour, as his eldest daughter Macy detailed multiple assaults. 
Hates five children, daughters Macy Lynn, 17, Briley Ann, 12, Sienna Bell, 7, and sons Eamon, 7, and Gavin, 4, were all discovered by police this morning after the murders with fatal gunshot wounds. Not far from the bodies was, a, was Mormon insurance, giant, insurance agent Haight, who police believe carried out the killing spree before turning the gun on himself. In a 2020 interview with authorities, Macy, the family's eldest daughter, said she was repeatedly assaulted, physical assault assertion of control, including being choked by her father, physical assault assertion of control, and very afraid that he was going to keep her from breathing and kill her. The child abuse investigation followed a police call from a non-family member reporting potential child abuse in August 2020. Macy, then 14, told investigators that her father's violence started in 2017 and had included choking and shaking, including a recent incident where he grabbed her by the shoulders and banged her into a wooden piece along the back of the couch. Physical assault, assertion of control, absence of emotional empathy. In his interview with investigators, Holt denied assaulting his daughter. Denial. Nullification of threat to control. He said Macy was mouthy, blame-shifting, and admitted to getting angry, attributing some struggles to his father's death and brother's divorce. Partial admission, but blame-shifting. The investigators' notes also shed light on Haight's treatment of his wife, Macy told investigators that her father would often belittle her mother, belittlement, a charge he denied, denial, nullification, threat, to control. There are then uh, the screenshots from social media whereby Lindsay has written, He was a two-faced abusive monster. My brother and sister-in-law were good friends with them for years. In fact, sister-in-law has been interviewed by multiple news stations about this tragedy because she was friends with Tausha. Her missed appointment was with a woman's crisis centre. She was in the process of finally working to get herself and the kids away from him when he did this. My brother said he was controlling, manipulative and mentally abusive for years, but no one knew how bad until recently. Absence of emotional empathy, sense of entitlement, lack of control, manipulations. He would demand she would have dinner on the table ready when he got home. Sense of entitlement, issuing of orders. No one ate until he took the first bite, assertion of control. If she was preparing dinner and he would call and say he wanted something else, she had to start over. Sense of entitlement, lack of accountability, absence of emotional empathy, triangulation. Once he was late coming home, so she let the kids start eating. When he got home... He saw them eating without him. He threw all the food on the floor and made her start dinner all over again. That, of course, is demonstrative of the ignition of fury as a consequence of wounding, the fact that they started eating without him, and, furthermore, a sense of entitlement in instructing her to start dinner all over again. He controlled her friendships, assertion of control, isolation. He controlled her friendships and what she could, could not do. He controlled her access to money, control of finances, and she had a meagre allowance to pay bills and care for the kids. He had hit her before, physical violence, and he would choke her till she passed out, physical violence. My bro says his biggest fear now is that he will get off with people thinking he was a good guy who somehow snapped or had mental illness. He was not. He was a deceiver and a monster. He played the role of a good, upstanding church guy, facade, but would go home and abuse his family. In his interview, however, Haidt said he'd taken his wife's iPad and cell phone to surveil her text messages to check if she had spoken negatively about his family. Assertion of control, paranoia. Tausha told authorities she didn't want criminal charges filed against her husband and hoped the incident would be a wake-up call for him. This, of course, the typical behaviour of a victim caught in fear and their own emotional thinking. Though an investigator told Haidt that his behaviour was close to assaultive, Enoch Police and the Iron County attorney decided not to file criminal charges against him. The murder-suicide rocked Enoch, a town of 8,000 people, in southern Utah, where neighbours and members of the local Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints described the Haight family as loving facade management from him. An account from a friend on the family on social media offered a contrasting perspective. 
That's what I have just detailed to you from the screenshot. An obituary published in the St. George Spectrum last week described Michael Haight in a more favourable light. And the obituary reads... Michael Orwin Haight was born on January the 7th, 1980, in Seattle, Washington, to Robin and Brenda Haight. After his dad finished dental school in 1981, the family moved to Cedar City, Utah. In his youth, Michael loved spending time participating in City League baseball, basketball, soccer, various outdoor and scouting activities. He achieved the rank of Eagle Scout. Michael excelled at everything he did. Graduating from Cedar High School in 1998, where he was the Sterling Scholar in Business. He was very involved in various sports and activities. Michael spent the summer after graduation working in Alaska in a fish processing plant. His leadership skills, value of honest hard work and determination quickly led him to be a line manager and over a crew of 10 to 12 men. Michael was called and served a full-time mission to Porto Alegre South, Brazil, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He loved the people he met on his mission and had many fond memories of his time spent there. After his mission, Michael began classes at Southern Utah University studying business. He graduated with his bachelor's degree from SUU in 2004, where he was named the Outstanding Finance Student for the School of Business. During this time, he met Tausha Earl in their student ward. They were married in the St. George Temple on May the 10th, 2003. It suggests a fairly quick wedding uh, there, which is another which is evidence of a sense of entitlement and a need to get the person under control. Michael enjoyed making memories with the family. He spent many evenings and Saturdays coaching the children's City League sporting teams, attending the children's concerts at school, going on side-by-side -side rides, doing home improvement projects, sledding and much more. Michael lived a life of service. Whether it was serving in the church or in the community, he was willing to help with whatever was needed. Michael owned and operated a successful insurance agency, receiving many awards and honours for his achievements. Many of his clients loved and appreciated the care and attention he gave to them. He recently sold his business to allow more flexibility to spend time with his family. Michael is survived by his mother Brenda Height, siblings Brian Tamara, Twitchell, Jennifer, Kirksiak, and grandparents Orwin and Velda Gubla. He's also survived by many aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, and cousins. This is a somewhat uh, glowing obituary, which of course demonstrates the manifestation of a facade that is being utilised, and of course demonstrates the way that many people were taken in by this external facade, whilst of course abuse was going on behind closed doors, typical behaviour of a narcissist. It would appear, however, that the obituary was taken offline as a consequence of a backlash to it. Undoubtedly, there'd be more information that would come out. But this is demonstrative of an individual that would maintain a facade to the outside world whilst engaging in abusive behaviour towards his family. Physically abusing them, emotionally abusing them, controlling them in the way that he did at dinner time. To the outside world, seen as a pleasant and upstanding member of the community, but behind closed doors, meeting out physical and emotional and psychological violence towards his spouse and his children, which demonstrates an absence of emotional empathy, lack of accountability for his behaviours, the response to threats to control, the manifestation of ignited fury. Quite clearly, this individual, engaging in these behaviours over a sustained period of time, passes the threshold to be seen as a narcissist. He shows various instances of a sense of entitlement, there was a swift marriage. He controlled with money. It's likely that there was a swift pregnancy, part of him enmeshing his wife and controlling her. It's clear that he orders people around. He even requires an immediate response, that he's also somewhat self-absorbed. He lacks accountability. Undoubtedly, he's somebody that tells lies because he was engaged in behaviours whereby he was abusing people but denied that he did so. He wouldn't provide his wife or family with any meaningful and genuine emotional support. It shows that his parental abrogation of his responsibilities and duties in being abusive, that he wouldn't have addressed relationship issues in a meaningful fashion. It's highly likely that this was an individual who never apologised for his behaviours. It's evident that there's grandiosity. 
He clearly thinks that he's something special, thinks he's better than other people. Undoubtedly, one would imagine that he would claim to be a better parent than his wife. He's evidently a haughty individual. He'd be dismissive, arrogant. He undoubtedly would exhibit an absence of patience with regard to his family and behave in an obnoxious manner. He was manipulative. It's evident that he would engage in the telling of lies. He triangulates people with objects, triangulates people. He was physically violent. He would smear. There would perhaps be false contrition issued at times if he was ever moved to go down that route. He belittled and invalidated individuals. He engaged in denial, made them feel guilty. He was provocative. He projected. He blame shifted. He controlled through food. He controlled through finances. Undoubtedly, he was someone who would revise history. He would accuse, make accusations out of nowhere, false accusations, intimidate, bully and deflect. He would regularly find fault. He would show various aspects of the narcissistic dynamic. There was familial discord, facade management. He was treating others as an extension of himself. There was character trait acquisition. There was black and white thinking. He exhibited a need to assert control over people and showed a response to potential threats to that control. He exhibited envy. There was objectification and compartmentalization. There was paranoia, for instance, the searching of the phones. Accordingly, this individual shows all aspects of a sense of entitlement, a lack of accountability, grandiose behaviours, haughty behaviours, manipulative behaviours, poor boundary recognition, for instance, in searching the phones, various aspects of the narcissistic dynamic and an absence of emotional empathy with regard to the abusive behaviours that he engaged in and then ultimately murdering his family. It's clear that Michael Haidt somebody who operated a facade on the outside and then as somebody that would be abusive behind closed doors was very much a narcissist. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.